It is wonderful to see so many people and as a result, as you could tell, we had a bit of an issue with you being able to come in here. I apologize for that. We were not able to come into the room until uh, the previous session was done and some of the dishes could be moved out of the way. I'm sorry about that. Uh, again, it is wonderful to see so many people. My name is Farena Menek. I'm uh, going to be moderating this session uh, around living longer, living better, insights from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, also referred to as the CLSA. This is a very unique session because in the room we have both CLSA participants but also CAG attendees. Uh, and currently there is a conference going on by the Canadian Association on Gerontology and we are combining a CLSA participant event with that conference. CAG, just so you know, is the premier multidisciplinary association in Canada for those who research, work and have an interest in the field of aging. So I do want to acknowledge and thank CAG for allowing us to piggyback onto the conference. I would also, before we get going, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the staff, CLSA staff. So, CLSA staff, please come a little bit up, wave so people can see you. These are the people. All right, I did not see Catherine Isht, you're also CLSA folks, please. Wave your hands, that's more people involved in CLSA. Great. Um, I'm going to just briefly go over the program for this session. And just to note, if they're CAG attendees, uh, the program order has changed a bit and uh, the people involved, so I'll, I'll let you know who that is. Just as a count, just for our own information, who in the room, if you could raise your hand, who is a CAG attendee, conference attendee. All right, there's a few of you. You know what, this is kind of funny. They're all kind of around the edges. The rest are CLSA participants. Anyway, but thanks for coming to this session. So, um, let me get, give you the overview. Uh, first of all, again, I'm Farina Menek. I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba. I'm the lead research investigator at the Manitoba site of the CLSA. I will be chairing this session. So my role is to uh, keep presenters on time. So should you see me standing up here waving a paper that's simply giving them two minute mark, if they do not stop, I will give them this sign. I am not trying to be rude to them, they all know me, and they also know that I will stand up and stop them should they talk too long. <laughs> all right, we will be starting with, uh, uh, the first presenter is Dr. Susan Kirkland, who is a professor at Dalhousie University from Nova Scotia. She is also the co-principal principal investigator of the CLSA. Dr. Kirkland will give an overview of the CLSA. Next, we will have Dr. Holly Tuko, who is a professor at the University of Victoria, and she will be presenting on cognition. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kathy Picora Fuller, who is a professor at the University of Toronto, who will be talking to us about hearing and vision and how it may relate to social participation. And lastly, we have Dr. Perminda Reyna, who is a professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, who is the lead principal investigator of the CLSA, and he will be talking about frailty and then wrap up this session. Uh, please hold off with questions until we're through the presentations. I hope to have some time. I, I know with a big group like this, there will be many more questions than we can actually accommodate. By the way, we will have microphones. Uh, there is one there, but we will have a microphone going around. Uh, there will be 
many more questions than we can accommodate. I know that. So uh, some of us will be here at the end of the session, and you can ask us directly one on one and if, any, if you have any more questions. All right. Without any further ado, Dr. Kirkland. Yeah. Thank you, Verena. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in Winnipeg, and it is an absolute joy to see all of you here today. It's so exciting and so rewarding for us. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, Verena? Verena? Verena. <laughs> okay, well, I can start talking. <laughs> Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, the overall study design of the CLSA and um, some of the milestones that we've encountered along the way and just give you a very quick, quick synopsis of yourselves uh, and then the other presenters will give some more details. I'm going to start off by telling you something that you already know. Canadians are living longer, and they're making up a larger share of the population. So right now, about one in six Canadians is over the age of 65. But by 2025, which is actually not that far off, one in five will be over the age of 65, and that's over 20 million people. What's really interesting is that we know that over time, life expectancy continues to increase. And it continues to increase by about two years every decade. And what we see now is that for life expectancy for birth, we know it's higher for women than it is for men. If you're a woman, your life expectancy for birth, from birth is that you can live 83.3 years. And for men, it's 78.8 years. But what's really interesting is if you make it to you can expect to live longer than that. So for women, they can expect to live another 21.6 years. And for men, they can expect to live another 18.5. And if you make it to 100, men and women combined can expect to live another 2.6 years. But what this points out to us is it's not important just to live long. It, we really need to live well. It's not about number of years, it's about quality of years. And so we really need to shift our focus. We really need to be thinking about not just studying what people die of, or how long they live, or what diseases they get. We really need to shift the bar. We really need to be thinking about healthy aging. We really need to be thinking about things like how do you maintain function? And how do you maintain ability? And how do you maintain independence? And how do you keep quality of life and autonomy and independence? And those things that you know, are really important to us every single day. So that's where the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging comes in. And that's where we take our focus. We're really trying to think about what does it mean to age in a healthy way? And we're not just looking at one aspect of aging. We're not just looking at you know, social aspects of aging and what it means to participate in your community. We're not just looking at the psychology of aging and what your mental health is like. We're not looking just at your genetics and what kind of genes you have. What we're trying to do is put it all together and really understand in a big way what it means to age and to age well. And so this is a very large team. There are three principal investigators. Two of us are here today. Um, and a number of um, experts from across the country in a wide range of disciplines have come together. And this really is quite unique. It's a very um, pan-Canadian study with exer experts from all the way across the country contributing to it. It really is the largest study of its kind to date in Canada. And the three of us who are the principal investigators are all epidemiologists. So that means that we're really interested in studying health and, and um, conditions in a population and from a population perspective. And we spend a lot of time on design and methodology. So it really has been an incredible experience. And in fact, it's, it's, 
it's a once in a lifetime experience to be able to design a study of this magnitude and not just design it but then actually turn around and implement it and and actually have it be a success so it's it's been uh, quite an amazing journey for the three of us and we've been working on this study since 2001 as epidemiologists, we thought, okay, so how can we design a study like this? How can we get the best information that we possibly could? And there are larger studies than this, but they don't catch as, capture as much information. There's smaller studies, but they really can't answer questions. There's studies that only look at people who are over the age of 65, and we know that you don't just, you know, flip a switch the day you turn 65 and become old. We know that it's a process, and we're interested in studying that process of aging. So those are all the things that went into the design. We really wanted it to be a Canadian study, but we knew we couldn't bring every single person into a, a center and capture uh, detailed information on them. So we have one arm of the study, which we call the tracking, where people are followed by phone. And they're randomly selected from across all of the provinces, and some of you are tracking participants. Then we have another arm where we set up 11 sites across the country and we, ask, we go into people's homes and then we also uh, have them come to a data collection site and we capture much more detailed information and clinical types of information from them and we also collect blood and urine. But what's really interesting is we have all the questionnaire information and we can put it all together for all 50,000 people. And as you know, we come back to you every three years and we ask you a lot of questions. What's really interesting is that because of this design, it means that we can actually roll it up and put it all together. And in many ways, we can talk about what the situation is for Canadians, for older Canadians. It's not just about, you know, small samples and older adults here and older adults there. We can actually talk about this prevalence of some conditions or some situations for, for older adults in the Canadian population. I'm not going to go through this, but you know we ask you a large number of questions on a whole bunch of different areas. But this, for researchers, this is an absolute pot of gold. You also know that we take a large number of samples from you. We ask you a lot of, or we make you do a lot of clinical tests. But for people who are on, who do the phone part, it's interesting to see what the, what the other side of the study does. And so there's a large number of uh, uh, clinical measures and physical measures that we also take. What you don't get to see is where your blood samples go. So these are the, uh, these are the, the nitrogen tanks that are actually housed at McMaster University. And there's actually 31 nitrogen tanks and all of your samples are stored there. And they lay in wait until uh, researchers apply to use them. And I think it's really important for you to understand that um, the information that you provide is, is available to researchers across the, can across the country, but also internationally. But we take very, very seriously the fact that we, we do everything that we can to pr pr protect your privacy and your confidentiality. We do everything that we can to secure the data and the biospecimens in a very safe way. We also make sure that we use them optimally. We know, especially for the biosamples, that they're not a, an unlimited resource. So we want to make sure that when they're used, they're used for the best purpose that will, that will uh, aid the health of Canadians. And they are made available to all researchers, but all researchers have to apply to use them and they have to be approved to use them through our data and sample access committee. Uh, so we are now at the point where we have recruited uh, 51,338 participants, of whom you are some of them. Uh, we have all of the baseline data that we collected initially now, uh, well, I shouldn't say all, but the majority of baseline data that we collected now available for researchers to use. Uh, we'll follow, finish up the first follow-up in the spring of 2018. And we have now, I put 99 here, but but by next week, we'll have about 120 projects that have been approved uh, to use this information to really try and capture what's going on. And you'll hear some of the work that's going on next. Um, and this just gives you a little word cloud. This was actually in the early days. It would change if we did it again now. But these are some of the, the themes that people are exploring using this information. 
What's really interesting is that we can get at subpopulations or subgroups that sometimes are really, really hard to get at. So for example, we now have one of the largest groups of veterans uh, that's ever been studied. And we did that because we specifically put a question on in the CLSA that identifies veterans. And I'm sure you've answered that question so you know what it is. We can also um, begin to start looking at other smaller groups like Aboriginal populations. And these groups of people are crying for information about themselves and their populations. So the CLSA can help to address that. Uh, we have a Francophone population. And again, the Francophone population, it, it, really is looking for information about that population. Uh, we also have ethnic groups, we have urban and rural groups, uh, we have people who are living with chronic diseases, we have caretakers, we have retirees, and these are just only some of the ways we can start to slice the data and make some sense and answer some things that we really want to know. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of interesting facts. You're going to hear a whole bunch of information this afternoon, but did you know that 19% of all CLSA participants chose to answer the questionnaires in French? That 84% live in a house? That almost 50% of CLSA participants have a pet? That 93% voted in the last election? That's pretty amazing. 16% were born outside of Canada. 23, almost a quarter of you, use some kind of assistive device for mobility, for hearing, or for vision. And the majority of people say that their health is good. There was only 10% who said that their health was either poor or fair. And also 86% are satisfied with their lives. There's much more to hear, and I'm not going to take up your time, uh, but I would just like to interest, introduce you to uh, some of the, the lead investigators. And you can see this is the Operations Committee, and the Operations Committee are the, the group that, that are responsible for running the data collection sites that you come to, and also the scientific leads who are responsible for the content of the questions that you answer. Uh, we also have, in addition to CIHR, who funds the operations of our study, and CFI, who is the major contributor to the infrastructure, so the space that, you, that we have and the equipment that we have, we have a wide range of partners who have also contributed, and I'd like to just recognize them here. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we are so thankful to you, the participants, who really do um, give up your time and uh, come back time after time to provide us with this really valuable, valuable information. So thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Holly Tuco from the University of Victoria, and today I've been asked to speak to you about some of the research my team and I are currently working on at the University of Victoria. In 2016, we received funding from the Alzheimer's Society of uh, Canada in partnership with the Pacific Alzheimer Research Foundation to examine cognition in the CLSA, or Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And I will apologize for my notes, but I know that Verena is a taskmaster, and I don't want to forget to say anything important, so I am going to look down at my notes every now and again so I get everything in in my limited time. So. Okay, where do I have to, the green one, yes. Where do I point the green one? Oh. That's not my presentation. <laughs> I don't have any octopi. Okay, so there's my slide. So, before we begin, I will define our terms so we all know, are on the same page about what I'm talking about. So the dictionary definition of cognition is conscious mental activities or the activities of thinking, understanding, learning, and remembering. 
So these activities are often referred to as cognitive functions and they're different types of mental activities that we engage in as we go about our daily lives. So cognition can be disturbed for various reasons and a change in cognitive functioning can affect a person's everyday behavior. For example, Alzheimer disease and other dementias are neurological or brain disorders that interfere with cognition or cognitive functions. So typically, we think of Alzheimer's disease as affecting memory and new learning, but as the disorder progresses, other cognitive functions are affected as well and will affect everyday behavior. So it's often changes in these cognitive functions um, that brings a person to clinical attention. Physicians, psychologists, and other healthcare providers typically form, uh, perform some type of assessment of cognition where there's a question um, to determine how a person functions in relation to other people with similar characteristics. So of a similar age or similar sex or educational background or culture or language. So there are both medical and non-medical factors that contribute to one's cognitive abilities and must be taken into consideration when we're assessing a person's cognition. There are many reasons why someone's cognition may change. It could be you're really tired, like Vanessa, one of my team, she didn't sleep last night, so she's not functioning really well today. Um, if you are physically ill, you have the flu, you know that you just don't function as quickly as you would otherwise. If you're on some types of medication, um, and uh, if you look on the label, sometimes it will say you shouldn't drive if you're taking this medication, or you shouldn't do other activities that require concentration, or uh, due to a limited sensory function. So if you can't hear what's being said to you, it may appear that you can't remember what was said, but you didn't hear it in the first place. So lots of reasons why cognition can be disturbed. So knowing how a person with certain characteristics are expected to perform on measures of cognition is fundamental for being able to identify medically relevant cognitive changes. So you've seen this slide before. It's the depth and breadth of the CLSA and all the wonderful things that we ask you. And the piece I have in red there are the cognitive assessment activities. Um, in the comprehensive, we have 30-minute battery. In the tracking cohort, it's a series of, of four measures that are given over the telephone. So. Um, we have lots of information about the physical health and lifestyle, as Susan mentioned. So uh, also, as you noted from what uh, Susan said on her last slide, the vast majority of the CLSA participants report themselves as being reasonably healthy. So we have a benchmark for comparison with other Canadians. So we have a pretty healthy population uh, in the baseline uh, uh, part of the study. So, with our cognitive measures, we can use these to create comparison standards for Canadians that can be used to help identify changes in cognition that would be greater than would be expected. You've also seen this picture before, and again, down in the bottom corner, there in red are the cognitive assessment of components. We look at memory executive functions or control functions, if you like, and then reaction time. This is our team across the country that we're working with. So you'll see me with a different haircut there um, and a different jacket. Uh, and we have um, Megan O'Connell at the University of Saskatchewan, um, Martine Simard at Laval University in Quebec City, Vanessa Toller, who's tired today because she didn't sleep last night from the University of Ottawa. Um, and then on the bottom left, we have our team at UVic, so Stacy Ball, uh, Dr. Helena Cadillac, and David Holt. And then Lauren Griffith, who Parminder will be imitating today. Um, he's stepping in for her today. So Lauren is at McMaster University. So with this team across the country, we're developing these measures. We meet every second week via video conference and talk to each other about what we're doing and share our information. 
It's one of the great advantages of CLSA is we are able to use this video conferencing system and meet regularly without the expense of flying back and forth across the country. So with our funding, we are uh, going to examine how Canadians typically perform on measures of cognitive functioning so we can understand the health and lifestyle factors that affect cognitive functions. And then with this knowledge, we can develop Canadian comparison standards for English and French speaking Canadians administered measures in the same way. So we'll look at the ones administered by telephone separately from the ones administered in the comprehensive, which are face to face. So we have this very large sample, as has been mentioned, and we'll be able to take many factors that affect cognitive functioning into consideration that other research in the past has not been able to do. This will provide us with more accurate standards to be used with other Canadians for identifying changes in cognition that may be related to certain non-medical or medical factors. So once we've created the Canadian comparison standards, we'll create, and have, we're beginning to do this now, create computer algorithms and other tools for interpretation that can be used by health providers in clinical practice. And we had a workshop about this earlier in the day today. So this will lay a foundation for the refinement of these comparison standards as new information becomes available over time. So we can look how they function as we all age. So before I want to go on, before I go on, I want to mention why it's important to have Canadian standards for these measures of cognition. First of all, most existing normative standards are based on non-Canadian samples, so typically American samples. And this is particularly important for the primarily French-speaking segment of the Canadian population as little comprehensive information is available for use in making comparisons when identifying changes in cognitive functioning. And even for the English-speaking um, members of our society, relying on data collected elsewhere in the world may not provide the level of sensitivity to change desired within our own healthcare system. Also, existing normative standards may be outdated. The collection of this type of data for creation of normative standards can be expensive and time-consuming, and for these re reasons, it may not be collected often, and existing data may be out of date and not relevant to the current population. Because believe it or not, the cognitive functioning of populations change with different cohorts. So people who were educated in the 1950s have a certain level of cognitive functioning. Those educated later on, it's different. Not to say better, but different. So we need to keep current. Existing normative standards for measures may not cover the full spectrum of ages from midlife to later life. Sometimes research, uh, the age range of interest may be restricted for various reasons and didn't cover all the age groups. So for many years, people over the age of 65 were not included in normative standards. And, uh, or uh, they were only uh, developed for people over the age of 65. And we are in the CLSA interested in the aging process so we started at age 45 and we're going up from there. And having measures that are the same for all people of all ages is very important in that context. The next reason why it's important to have Canadian comparison standards is because the collection of data for the creation, as I mentioned, can be expensive and time consuming. So in the past, uh, small sample sizes have typically been used to create these standards. Um, and when you have very small samples, you can't look at all the factors that you want to look at. So we'll be able to do that with this data set. And typically, the normative standards have been developed on individual measures, so one measure at a time. And this, again, is for cost and time reasons. Even though in clinical practice, these measures are often used together as a battery, so you're given a number of measures at the same time. So when individual tests are combined in this way, there's an increased likelihood that an error will be made, um, and that error means that people will be identified, could be identified as impaired when they're not. 
because it's important to control for that combination of tests when you're looking at the results. So we feel it's very important that we have our own Canadian standards and that we take all of these things into consideration when developing these standards. So first of all, to begin, we needed to have a plan. So we're midway through the process now, but our plan was to select, to select a neurologically healthy subsample from the CLSA and then to examine performance on each measure and sometimes, for whatever reason, there are impossible scores in there, so we have to take those out or they'll mess up our analyses. So we have to look at that. And then we need to describe performance on each measure to identify the possible important influences. So does this measure change with age? Is it, does it differ between men and women? Um, does it differ uh, between people with different levels of educational attainment? Um, is, do it, does it differ between French and English speakers? Does hearing play a role? Does vision play a role, etc.? Does general health play a role? So we look at all those factors. Then, once we've looked at all that, we try to characterize each measure, taking into account the important influence for that particular measure. We've, uh, as I mentioned, we're part way through. We've done this with the tracking data, and we're moving on to the comprehensive data uh, very soon. This is all with the baseline, the first data collection set. Then, we'll combine the measures to minimize the over-identification of poor performances and, increased, and to increase the specificity as to typical performances. And then we will pr propose our user-friendly tools for interpretation that can be used by healthcare providers in clinical practice. And we did our, showed our first mock-up of that tool this morning and got some feedback from the uh, participants at the Canadian Association on Gerontology to help us design the best tool possible. And then we will consult with health providers in clinical practice and researchers. Again, we'll go out again. We've done it once here. We'll go out twice more uh, concerning the adequacy of our methods and our tools to make sure we've thought of everything. And then we'll re rework our tools to address concerns and maximize their utility for easy access by clinicians and researchers. No point to develop a really fancy tool and nobody uses it, right? So we have to find ways to make it usable. So just a little uh, insight into what we found out so far. So we began by looking at performance of the neurologically healthy CLSA participants on the measures of cognition, and I'll briefly describe three different sets of analyses we've undertaken. So first, I'll talk about comparisons with other studies that use similar measures. Then we looked at the relation between number of medical conditions and performance on the cognitive measures. And then I'll tell you a little bit about observations of how CLSA participants remember to remember. So first off, um, it, with the tracking cohort, the approximately 20,000 telephone interviews, um, we have our four measures there. And we do collect them over the telephone, which is different from other studies. So we wanted to see, does that make a huge difference, collecting things over the telephone? So we have similar, okay, similar scores. Um, to other studies in the field, which tells us that collecting our data over the telephone is an acceptable approach and tells us uh, our data will be relevant uh, for application by other people as well. Our second thing, do medical conditions affect the scores? Um, short answer, no. Again, our population, you, are very healthy people, and so we did not find a relation between number of medical conditions and cognitive performance. The remembering to remember, this is from the comprehensive data, the 30,000 people who go to the data collection sites, uh, and they're asked to perform a number of tasks, and one of these tasks is have uh, people do specific tasks when a timer sounds or at a specific time. And uh, this is a relatively new measure, and we've taken a close look at performance of our neurologically healthy sample in English and French. So basically, when we examine performance on this measure, men and women, age groups, and uh, okay, so we saw that overall men and women don't perform differently, even though we might think they would, um, on either the event or the time-based tasks. 
Similarly, we saw that overall French and English speakers do not perform differently on the event and time-based task. Age groups do, uh, it, for both English and French speakers, um, do perform differently on the event and time-based task. And English speaking groups differ in educational attainment, but the French speakers do not differ on these tasks by educational attainment. So we're seeing different things in the English and French samples. So um, those are just our preliminary things. We've published papers, three papers, one on each of these uh, areas. And so we have our ongoing research. We will continue with our analyti analytics to look at the comprehensive uh, uh, data set now and to take our uh, prototype or mock-up of our web-based tool around for clinicians to look at. Um, and then we'll, uh, uh, hopefully by the end of all this, we anticipate sharing all of this information with researchers, clinicians, and other interested parties like yourselves. Um, as we take each step in the process, we'll come out and share that information um, about how we're going about exploring this current extensive collection of information for Canadians. Okay. Oh, so many bright faces. Are you enjoying this event? All right. Well, I'm having a great time. We're all having a great time. So um, CLSA is a great thing for Canadians, whether you're in the study or doing the study. So I am going to tell you a little bit about one of the topics of great importance to me and my colleagues. So I guess you got the idea we work in teams, and there's a lot of us. So a few who have worked on this are uh, Paul Mick, who is an ear, nose, and throat doctor in Kelowna, uh, Walter Wittich, who is a professor in the School of Optometry at the University of British Columbia, Don Guthrie works in health information in uh, Waterloo, Ontario at Wilfrid Laurier, and Natalie Phillips is a neuropsychologist. So even on our team, we have hearing people and vision people and cognition people and people that work on population health and we really just want to see some of these important connections and how they could change the way you might live better and the way we might do health better. So people have started. I'm pressing the green button. OK. The octopus has returned. So why do I have an octopus here? I was watching TV one night and they had this show about octopus and they went into how octopus is a social creature and they survive, how do they survive? By changing their shape, right? And I thought, thank goodness I do not have to do that. You know, I'm lucky if I can sit in a chair. But what my health promotion colleagues would say is that health is the capacity of people to adapt to, respond to, or control life's challenges and changes. And we have lots of those things as we get older. But we are not a solo creature, we are social creatures. So I would say that how do we survive, how do we stay well, is because we can adapt socially. And in fact, there's a paper that has been in many, many citations at this conference um, that has got us all thinking. And it actually says that social relationships are one of the strongest things that are actually related to how long you live. Okay, so I think, you know, this, we are kind of the social octopus, and there's science that would back up this fact that I'm sure you all believe. So I think of the words of one of the women with hearing loss who uh, I had a interaction with at one time and she said to me because I'm interested in hearing loss and I'm interested in aging she wanted to tell me this it was really important to her she says when you are hard of hearing you struggle to hear when you struggle to hear you get tired when you get tired you get frustrated when you get frustrated you get bored 
when you get bored, you quit. But then she says, I didn't quit today. So you guys are all here, so I'm guessing you are not quitters, which is very good for us to study you. So I think you can see, yeah, maybe there's something going on in those ears, but it creates some cognitive challenge, it creates some emotional stress, and then ultimately you decide to stay home. And then you fall into that cycle where other things are going to start to go wrong with your health. And indeed, in the last decade or so, we have seen more and more headlines about how sensory loss, hearing loss, which is going to affect about half of the people, you know, once they get to retirement age, and it's going to affect 80% of the people by the time they get in their 80s. Very, very common. Third highest common chronic disability in age. And it is connected to a whole lot of things. Uh, mortality, dementia. It actually is predictive of incident dementia 10 years later. Uh, depression, falls, injuries, frailty, and social isolation, which has got this huge connection to how long you're going to survive. So I don't know if you saw any headlines in the summer, but there was this paper in The Lancet, which is a big fancy medical journal, and it was looking at you know, some of the risk factors that come at different stages of life and which ones could we possibly do something about. And hearing loss is one that starts early. You know, it starts when you're in your 40s. Average age of first time hearing aid use is 70. But these kind of cascade of problems into social isolation are happening later. So could we nip this in the bud by doing something about sensory issues? And to answer that kind of question, the CLSA is just a, a tremendously valuable uh, way we can try to look at this, the connection of hearing to these other things. So it's kind of like we're having this big Humpty Dumpty experience, putting all these pieces together. So we wanted to know, uh, is hearing loss and also vision loss and combined sensory loss, does it, what does it have to do with how many people you interact with, with the kinds of activities you do that you participate in, about how available social support from your friends and family and others is, and how lonely you are. Because loneliness is also something that uh, we've become increasingly concerned about. So this is just based on the tracking data. And we have your comments about, is your hearing, using a hearing aid if you have one, excellent, good, fair, or poor? Right? You told us that. We have a similar question about vision. So you told us that. Now we have this comprehensive data that you gave in the clinic so we can actually get into more detailed measures and we're just starting to analyze that. And then for the outcome measures, we have four kind of areas of social activity that we can look at. So um, I don't think those pictures are any of you, but... Uh, you know, you're a pretty, pretty out there group, so who knows? Okay, so you answered these questions. So do you remember answering this question about social networks? So we're measuring how many people you interact with. You get a point for being married or having a domestic relationship, and you can get more points to get to the maximum of 10 if you interact with your children, with your friends, with your neighbors, people in your religious group. Okay, so we're looking at how many people are you interacting with? What are your connections? We are looking at how many activities you do. And uh, so for our purposes in the analysis, we said that uh, you have low social participation if you don't do any of these things at least once a week. And that uh, number eight there, any other rec recreational activities with others? I don't know if any of you really do fencing with your walkers. You know, but I guess some people do. So, what are you actually out there doing? And then uh, the next measure is social support. So, do you have people who can help you out, who can uh, take you places, who can listen to you, who can give you love and support? So, we're also looking at availability of social support based on the questions you answered. And then we have a slightly different idea about loneliness here, which was just one question that you answered. In the past week, how often did you feel lonely? And so you are not lonely if you never felt this. 
um, if you answered less than one day a week. Okay, so you can be lonely even in a crowd, which I think is what I'm trying to get at with that picture. So these are, thanks to our social group um, who developed these measures, now us sensory people can start to learn about social matters. And just one, I just have one slide to summarize what we found. So the people who said they had good hearing and good vision are the comparison group. So compared to people who have good hearing and vision, people who have vision loss or combination of hearing and vision loss, they actually were worse off down all of these social measures. Interestingly, people with hearing loss who self-reported hearing loss, so maybe some of them were great hearing aid users, doesn't mean they didn't have a hearing loss, but the ones who had, who had you know, difficulties that they hadn't resolved yet, really where the action was here was on, they didn't have social support and they felt more lonely. Okay, so, so I think that's important. And finally, I'm really happy as somebody who's worked um, clinically as, a, as an audiologist and, and as a researcher in psychology, you know, I think finally we have made a breakthrough in terms of how we understand age-related hearing loss. And it has, it's changing. I think it's already changing. We had a presentation here yesterday that, you know, the people who are doing the hearing care are, have stopped thinking about your ears and they started thinking about your life because we realize that, you know, what's going on in your ear is connected to your life and ultimately to the rest of your health. And that that could change how we practice. And I think it's also, you know, there's a message here for all of the other people in healthcare to whom you go, that when you go and they are trying to help you with whatever your other health problems are, that they can do a better job if they can communicate with you better and know about your hearing and vision needs. So I think working together is going to get us all further ahead. And just to look at the future, uh, now that we have the data that you provided in uh, the sites, in the test sites, we have more we can, we can use. And we are gonna try to get to the bottom of some of these connections that have become known. You know, we know this connection to sensory lo loss and cognitive loss, but we don't understand why. And one of the possible explanations is people with sensory loss you know, start to have this uh, lack of social engagement, and then that in turn, their brain doesn't get so much exercise, and then they have cognitive loss. So what is there to that hypothesis that we can actually get at with CLSA? So I think, I think we're gonna really learn a lot by putting these pieces together. And uh, do you know where that is? Is that in Manitoba? It could, uh, it could be many places in Canada. I think it's actually Paul Mix photo of Kelowna. So uh, we can all go visit Paul and talk more about hearing and social factors. Thank you very much. I guess, uh, as Holly said, I am presenting on behalf of Lauren Griffith, who is unfortunately not She's actually fortunately attending her sister's wedding in Boston today. And, uh, and I, I actually right now don't know who I am because as I was sitting at this table, um, I was uh, greeted in Italian. And, uh, and uh, I said, I sort of tried to pay attention and uh, th th this gentleman thought I was Italian. And that reminded me of a story uh, when I was in Hamilton that taxi cab came to pick me up to take me to the airport. It was an old Italian gentleman. He had a little hat on. And as I get into the taxi, he goes, uh, Dr. Reina, are you Italian? I said, uh, no. I stopped for a few minutes and I said, how come you asked me that? He goes, sir, your last name, Reina. I said, what's wrong with my last name? He goes, oh, that's a very common name in Calabria, Italy. I said, oh, that's really good. He goes, sir, no, that's not good. They are really bad people. They are one of the biggest mafia in Calabria. So, <laughs> so I'm representing the CLSA mafia here today. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to be talking about uh, frailty, and I will define what that means. And this is the, the people at the bottom, Lauren Griffith, her master's student, David Cantors, uh, David Hogan, Chris Patterson, and uh, Julie Richardson, and then myself. This is a team which you're already getting the idea that teams are formed to answer many of these uh, questions and use the CLSA data. And I think it's important to note that you guys here sitting and coming to our answering telephones and coming to, allowing us to come to your home or coming to data collection sites are giving lots of data, which is complex data. So you need multiple types of brains to be able to sort of what we are trying to study. And I think it's, a, it's just a tremendous opportunity for all Canadians and people around the globe what this study will provide in the coming years. And I'm going to put a plug in here right up front. Uh, the only reason what we are saying, what Holly was describing, what Susan described, or what Kathy described, couldn't be done unless you were giving your time to provide these data. And it's going to be even more important that as the study goes forward, you stay in the study uh, as much, as long as you can, because the validity of this type of science is based on your participation, and we hope you will continue to uh, engage with this uh, initiative. So there is lots of things that we hear in the media, in many other circles. Uh, you know, one of the, my pet peeves is whenever I hear somebody in the media talks about gray tsunami or some sort of a negative connotation with aging, because aging is an asset. This is one of the biggest achievements of the modern medicine public health. We are living long in a healthy fashion all around the globe, not just in Canada, but even in some of the developing countries, those patterns are changing. But this is what the perception of aging is. People think as people start to get old, they start to decline. Some of that happens, that the natural aging process. But people think it's always going to result, all older people have the same pattern and they get uh, dependent and they become burden on the society. But the reality is much, much different. In fact, there is no typical older person. Actually, there is probably 400 of you in this room and each one of you have a very different story to tell and you have very different experiences related to your day-to-day -day function. So there is no typical older person. So the question comes, how do we sort of understand that heterogeneity in old, older uh, individuals? And if we think about health and functional abilities, not in older people, but in all people, uh, it is not random. There are certain things that have happened that actually makes us age differently. Our genetics, that play a role. That's why we collect bloods and urine samples from you, so we can study that part. Um, we also want to understand where you live. How does that data actually contribute to how you age? If you live in neighborhoods where there is no transportation, you're not likely to go out. That actually is going to change the trajectory that you are uh, going to take in relation to your aging process. Um, your behaviors, if you smoke, if you don't do exercise, is going to have negative impact as to what happens to that aging process. And also, we need accesses to service, whether they be healthcare services or social services. All those things come together to impact the trajectory we take. And this is supposed to be one single slide. Uh, one of the interesting things about aging is as we start to age, we actually start to differentiate. If you look at the early years in life, most people, if you took few young people and put them right next to each other, they pretty much look the same from their capabilities point of view. There might be small variations, but you can't really tell that they are, they, they, they are different in any shape and form other than their facial features and the color of the skin or something like that. But as we get to the middle age, we actually start to differentiate. There are different trajectories we take. And the question comes, one of the important questions from the CLSA point of view that we want to understand, how do you keep these people above this frailty threshold. So there are different spectrums of frailty that people have. How do we understand that? And what triggers that frailty trajectory for someone to become uh, uh, functionally dependent or go on to uh, die uh, prematurely? 
So that's what the whole idea about the frailty is to understand the heterogeneity in the population. So what is frailty? Frailty is a clinical state in which there is an increase in individual's vulnerability for developing increased dependency or mortality. And it, it usually happens as a function of some sort of a stressor. And stressor is a generic word here that we are using. It can be a chronic condition. It could be a life event, the, the death of a spouse or the death of a family member, or getting a new diagnosis or your experience in hospitalization. Because I don't know how many of you uh, probably had this experience when I used to talk to my grandmother, no matter what happened, she was not going to go to the hospital because she had seen again and again the people who went into the hospital never came out alive. And that was the issue that, that because we used to actually make people immobile, keep people in the bed and let them rest. And that is the worst thing you could do to anyone in relation to frailty and muscle loss and, and decline in health. So those types of stressors can play, can play in, in uh, starting the frailty spectrum. And from a CLSA point of view, from a population point of view, why do we want to measure frailty? Uh, we want to identify people early. If they are pre-frail, so something we can do. So we can delay any form of disease and disability those people might experience uh, later in their life. If we identify people early, you can design better prevention and treatment options for those individuals. And from a population health point of view, from a public health point of view, if we understand the frailty of a given population, we can design public health intervention to shift the whole curve to the left, that the curve you see here. So we can say, if we can delay the frailty by seven years, we will actually improve the quality of life by almost 10 to 15 years that you couldn't achieve by removing or treating any single disease. So it's an important concept that, that actually can uh, make the later years of one's life uh, much more enjoyable. So that's why we are trying to understand and study this phenomenon. And, and there are challenges that, that have been there, and hopefully CLSA will address many of those challenges. And any good measure of frailty should be able to help us understand um, how it do, is it a biological thing, or is it a social issue, or is it a functional issue? How does actually frailty begin? Because frailty is something to do with your underlying reserve, your resilience, and how does that resilience change is an important uh, concept to understand. And how does it relate to social, environmental, and behavior factors? And you heard different talks had this theme already, if you sort of have a hearing problem or vision problem, it starts to contribute to your frailty. And that contribution of the hearing and vision to frailty has implication in relation to, let's say, social isolation and loneliness, which is deadly. In fact, I was reading a paper yesterday that said uh, loneliness equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It is a major, major health issue around the globe. And to answer some of these questions, you require longitudinal data. That's why Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging becomes a really important platform to be able to answer these questions. Verena, how am I doing with time? Lots of time? OK, good. You know, you guys don't know, Verena is actually from Switzerland. Time is really important to her, right? So I want to make sure I don't stress her out because that could trigger frailty here. <laughs> and, and as I said, when we look at the biological things, you look at social things, you look at behavioral things, so you need to design a study that can bring all sorts of those factors. So when you next time go uh, answer a telephone call or you go to some, someone comes to your home or you come to data collection, keep in mind all those pieces of information are critical even though it takes a little bit of time. It puts demands on your time, but it is absolutely critical pieces of data to be able to answer some of these very important questions that will have implication not in 30 years, 40 years, or 50 years, but in the next five to 10 years. So, so I'm trying to emphasize that your, your contribution is what is making all of this possible. Of course, the money from the government helps too. So one of the objectives of the David Cantor's, the master's students project was to create a frailty index because 
that when we go walk around and we see, we can actually look at and say to people, yeah, that person looks frail or they, they are some weak or something is not right with them. But from a research point of view, you want to be able to quantify in a reliable, valid fashion so you can study that phenomenon. So we, one, one needs to create a, some sort of a measure that can quantify frailty index. And, and one of the frailty index that we use, which is developed by a Canadian, Ken Rockwood, is that which basically looks at all sorts of deficits that you have. And of all the deficits that might be possible, how many deficits you have, and that, that determines the degree of frail, uh, frailness in an individual. And then you want to say, what do we think is related to frailty? How can we validate that actually what we are measuring is frailty, it's not something else? So that was the intent of this project. And this is the distribution of that particular frail. Here you can see you're hearing this theme again and again. Majority of you are very healthy people. And that's not just happened because of the criteria we use to select people into the study. But there is still around 7% of people who are actually frail in the study. And they are going to be on a different trajectory than the people who are much more uh, on the healthier uh, spectrum of the frailty. And it's an important thing you know, for example, uh, the 6.9% per percent of the people uh, scored frailty index of 0.25. That basically means is that the quarter of the variables that we measure had some sort of a deficit attached to it. So there was a, some sort of an issue from a health point of view, from a social point of view, or a psychological point of view that affected their frailty. And frailty also differs depending on what type of a population you're looking at. Here you can see, even in the CLSA con con context with this much healthier population at the baseline, um, the frailty levels are a little higher in low-income people, and, and there is a, some sort of an income gradient as well. And so what are the factors that relate to frailty that we wanted to look at in relation to understanding whether we are measuring frailty or not? It is natural to think that the younger people would be less flair, uh, frail. So the data showed, yes, this, they were less frail. Males tend to be less frail. Uh, high income people are less frail, and high educate, highly educated people are less frail. So on the other side, older female, more falls, more injuries, need home care, they were using some sort of assisted device and socially isolated. So one of the things I wanted to, this is what we have done now. Now, I'm showing you this slide, not that you really need to understand this slide. I made it, I suffered for a couple of hours trying to make it up. I thought, if I suffered, you should suffer too, right? <laughs> so let's suffer together. So one of the implications, you heard from uh, uh, Kathy that you know, social isolation is an important piece, and we know frailty, as it becomes worse, people become limited in their abilities, disability sets in, and those factors, mobility impairment type of uh, factors, can have a major impact on social isolation. People become lonely, socially isolated. And there have been studies done on primates, and I'm showing this as an example what else one could do with the CLSA data in the coming years, because many of you are giving blood samples and urine samples, and you want to know how will that be used. This is an example of that. And in these primates, these studies were done, they had taken these primates, and they, which are very social animals, and they put them in isolated environments. So they were socially isolated. So the body, the brain, actually sensed that as a stressor and it started to make these changes in the brain. And it releases some chemicals, and you start to seeing inflammation in the body. We knew this before. There was nothing special about that pathway. But what actually they showed was really interesting. And that is when they took the socially isolated animals and put them back into the, their natural environment, they started to get infections and they couldn't get rid of the infections of those individuals, which happens in people as well. Pneumonia as a function of surgical intervention happens a lot. And what they found was that because of the social isolation trigger, what changes that started to happen in the brain, the messages were being sent to the bone marrow where the stem cells are created, and those stem cells result in all these little cells at the bottom which are in our bodies right now, in our blood circulating and fighting all the infection, couldn't be replaced. So as the infection happened, what was, whatever was in the system got used up, the new cells were not being 
uh, uh, created. So there was no system in our body to be able to fight these in infections. Now, this was done in uh, primates. We have all this data collected in the CLSA in the coming years. We are going to be able to test these hypotheses that is that happen in humans or not? Or is there some other phenomena that is happening? And I think that couldn't happen. We couldn't do studies like this and, in, and design uh, interventions or differentiate people what is a biological or origin versus a social origin. If we understand these phenomena, in this case, we wouldn't have to give a pill to people. We will just have to make sure that people are not socially isolated so we can have a social intervention because we have medicalized many of these things uh, in, in our society. So these types of things are able to uh, allow us to be able to isolate, isolate those phenomena. So in summary, uh, changes in frailty we are going to be able to see and allow us to develop trajectories and assess how people actually decline and what are the triggers of those. And, in, and obviously all of this what we are doing is to help us de uh, uh, design new intervention, evaluate these interventions so we can change the trajectory of this frailty and, and make people live in their homes and in their communities as long as possible or place of their choice. Thank you. see how intimidating I am. Uh, it's uh, my students too, they, they're well trained, they know that we keep on time. We have some time, which is again great. Uh, if you have any questions, so we have about, we have to, the session is only 20 minutes longer, so of course if you have to leave now, feel free. Uh, but we do have 20 minutes for questions, after that we'll we have some of the presenters need to leave, they have to go to the airport, but some of us will be here, so, so you could be coming up. Um, we have a microphone, I'm just looking, the microphone, yes, we have a microphone. Are there any, oh, we have two microphones, one on each side, so any questions at all to any of the presenters about CLSA findings? We have a question here in the middle. I don't need it. Ah, uh, yeah, no, if, if you could please still, if you could please just use it anyway. I know they're loud voices, but it's a big room. It's a very large room. Okay. I just want to personally thank the CLSA for this opportunity to come and hear a little bit about what's going on. My question is, is there without detracting from the research, any thoughts about a website where we could go and look at what's going on? Um, that's a good question. And uh, we, as the projects are being done, we are putting little summaries on the, our website right now. You can see all the 99 projects that have been approved to use our data. As the results start to come out, uh, we are going to put the links of these papers on our website and people who are interested, they can click and read. Um, uh, I think, I don't know if any of the funders are in the room. Uh, if we do get some resources to translate some of this information in lay uh, blogs for our participants, uh, that will be tremendous. But. Uh, uh, right now we are just going to be sort of going through these stages. Papers are just beginning to come out and we are putting the hyperlinks to that so you can go and read it. So please visit our website. Uh, we actually were talking yesterday. I don't think uh, it's easy for many of you to go to our website to find those papers. We are actually going to bring them more to the front forefront so you can actually get uh, to those types of pieces of information much, much faster in easy fashion. Also, just to add, increasingly the newsletter. Um, are you receiving the CLSA newsletter? I see a few nods. You should be. If you don't, let us know. Uh, increasingly, we do have some results in there, and I think that's just going to get going as there are so many projects happening across the country. But so you'll hopefully see a lot more of that. Uh, my question is, do we know what percentage of the population uh, has dementia? I'm 
assuming it's age related, that there are more elderly people with dementia than younger? That's a very good question and thank you for asking that. Um, we don't know in the CLSA right now and the reason why is because when we um, enrolled you into this very large study and we're asking you to participate for a very long period of time, we had to make sure that you were able to give us consent to do that. And so one of the requirements was when you entered into the study that you had to be essentially cognitively competent. But as you know, one of the things that we're doing is trying to follow people as long as we can, even if they develop uh, cognitive decline over time. And that's why we ask you to identify a proxy. That's why we ask you to give us an indication of how you'd like to be followed into the future. So we will be able to determine that later down the road, but we certainly can't do that at this stage. Oh, um, just from other studies, not our study, but uh, there was a previous study called the Canadian Study of Health and Aging that actually looked at the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's in Canada. So we have information from that study that approximately 8% of the population over the age of 65 has some form of dementia um, and it goes up with age. Uh, so we know from our previous studies that, that that's the prevalence and the incidence, but um, not from this study. Hello. I uh, am wondering about the uh, uh, problems with the number of people who have hearing disabilities and it's very, very hard for people to ever get a hearing aid. Financially, that's a huge problem and I don't know if there's any, any movement in that area to help people with, with their hearing. I understand how debilitating it is. I could add to that that I really appreciate all your work. Thanks. Um, it's a very big issue and um, again it's something that's hard to study but in addition to the study that Kathy's doing we're also looking at um, hearing and vision and mobility loss and one of the things that we're trying to look, sorry, look at is what are unmet needs so of the people who report that they have a hearing loss or of the people who we test and we see that they have a hearing loss, then what proportion actually don't have access to a hearing aid or some kind of aid or report that they're not using those aids. Now, that kind of information won't automatically translate into getting hearing aids for people who need them, but it's, the ki it's information like that once it gets out there that can be used um, to increase the case for um, increased coverage, for example, for hearing aids. Yes. Uh, am I still on? Yeah? Don't, I don't, okay. So we, we can talk later. Uh, it, it, like health in Canada, it depends a lot on the province you're in. So um, if, if you are in the province of Quebec, you have a certain amount of hearing loss, you get your hearing aid. In Ontario, um, if a clinician thinks that you need a hearing aid, the government will subsidize it. So there, it depends on the province you're in, how exactly the funding goes. And I think there's, you know, it's an evolving story and there's lots of uh, uh, effort that, that people are putting into that. But I think really for me, it takes, it's not the hearing aid which is, um, really the story in a way because people wait 10 or 20 years on average before they get their hearing aid. And what I want to know, you know, I know what happens when people get to a clinic and I know what happens when they have decided to get a hearing aid, but what I can learn from CLSA is about what happens in those 10 or 20 years while you're kind of having trouble and things are getting harder but you haven't yet made the decision to go and try to get one. 
So I think there are a lot of environmental things. There's a lot of, we have this age-friendly uh, initiative that has been talked about widely at this conference. So what can we do in your municipality so that you can still participate in events? Because acoustics is something that is not optimal. You know, if you had a wheelchair, you would expect there to be a ramp. You would expect there to be an elevator. But we haven't kind of tackled either the physical environment or the social environment for people with hearing loss. So we, I, I personally, I really enjoy having this social engagement emphasis instead of just, yeah, get a few more decibels. Uh, it's not about the decibels, it's about staying socially engaged. And there are lots of ways you can do that. And you may have followed this that, you know, these days, people who make hearing aids are really worried because you can get a, an, an amplifier on your cell phone and you can get these devices which are dirt cheap and are actually as good as many hearing aids. So, so that's kind of a turning point in the field that things are getting cheaper and they're converging with other communication technologies and so finally the clinicians can actually work with you as human beings instead of uh, just as ears. So I think, I think the story of hearing aid cost is kind of, we'll have a different discussion in 10 years time. But I, I think the, the important point that comes out of this comment or question you had is that in the context of the aging population in, at a populated, population level, we have many data gaps that don't allow us to be able to have a conversation with the policymakers. And I think CLSA is going to fill that gap, is going to give us data, not that they are going to be always going to listen to our data, but after a while it's hard to ignore data evidence in your face, people are going to look at it. And I think that's one of the things the CLSA is going to do in the coming years is sort of minimize the gap we have in relation to information that will result in designing programs and policies that help uh, many people across the country. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my question is, has there been any effort to follow the exceptionally healthy, the exceptionally uh, well-preserved uh, people and see what, there's, uh, what works. I would think that th this would be the biggest benefit of a study of this sort. Maybe I can tackle that a bit. In the CLSA, we will have opportunity to follow these people from a general population perspective. But there are these communities around the world uh, called, uh, there are six blue zones, and these are in places like Sardinia, uh, Loma Linda, California, Costa Rica, Okinawa, Japan, where the majority of the people are actually centenarians and very healthy. They don't have many diseases. And, and, uh, and people have looked at those populations, but they are super agers, they are very different. And one of the things, obviously genetics has something to do with it. Also, how the older people are actually perceived in their communities. The, the young kids, young people, actually don't have a concept of age. There's a very interesting, um, uh, if you go to YouTube, if you have access to the internet, uh, there is a documentary by Na through the National Ge Geography geographic that they talk about these blue zones. They, they, have a, they all have some sort of a, what we call the Mediterranean diet. They either live by the ocean or live by the uh, mountains. So there is, a, there is this multiple environmental, bio, the building blocks I was talking about in my uh, talk, that's what these people have. And one of the things that comes out biologically is that they have a a good cholesterol, the levels of good cholesterol are much higher, which we call HDL. And when I was an undergraduate student, I used to remember it by saying happy uh, cholesterol and a lousy cholesterol. So it's the happy cholesterol that they have lots more than general populations. So we have some information from there. Yeah, but I think, uh, thank you for my opportunity. My question relates to just how close and current you want to be uh, monitoring the participants. 
If a participant has a significant change in health, would CLSA like to be notified, or would we wait, just wait until the next interview? That's a very good question. Um, the way that the way that information is processed in the CLSA, we only have the opportunity to capture it every three years. But it's very important to us to understand when you have a major change in your life, whether it's you know a health event or some other event that really has changed things dramatically for you. So the best thing to do, you can call us or email us and let us know, but we can't actually put that data into your file in a useful way until the three-year period. So I think we can capture it and we can make notes, but it's not truly going to show up in the data until the three-year point. So it's very important when you do have your interview that you let the interviewer know. Just to add to that comment, uh, lots of things happen in one's life, and if for some reason that event uh, might make it difficult for us to contact, contact you in the future, it is important that you let us know where you are and what's going on with, with you so we can find you for the time when the interview period comes. But in the meantime, you can actually keep a little diary of those events. So when the time comes for us to collect that data, you can actually provide that information and we can capture it. So that's one mechanism to be able to capture that critical major event that might happen in your life. You. My turn? Okay, how about, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the delineators that you use to deal with cognitive loss or dementia. My experience here with my medical practice is that um, the only things that they use will show any information so far into the process. There's nothing at the beginning to indicate cognitive loss. There's no measures that are being taken. So whatever you have developed to deal with that over time, is that going to be available to physicians to be able to use? Certainly with respect to the cognitive data we're working on, that's our goal, yes, is to have that publicly available for uh, practitioners of what, whatever else out there to use for the cognitive data. Um, you want to speak to other data? Again, one of the goals we hope for is that the tools that we use will be available as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you all on speaking uh, English I could understand. I was half expecting a bunch of words that were way over my head. And it was really pleasant to be here and, and have a down-to-earth uh, information. Secondly, uh, not near as important, but just to cause trouble. Next time, could you hold a uh, place where the parking is cheaper? <laughs> I am sorry about the parking cost, I know. You could, you could ask right now. Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for a wonderful time to share. I happen to be one of those who has now reached the, the 80s, and I'm beginning to deal with uh, hearing loss and uh, mobility problems. And uh, remarkably, one of the things that uh, has uh, caused me more stress than some of the things that you guys mentioned is uh, the new revolution of the social media. My grandchildren, they spin around on their cell phones like you wouldn't believe, and they lose me so quickly that I don't know what to do. 
And I wondered whether you might go ahead and uh, make sure that CLSA also includes the study of the social media as the research goes on. Thank you very much for that uh, question. We actually have some questions in the CLSA as to the use of social media, and we are probably in the coming years going to beef it up a bit more as we understand that phenomena exactly related to the question that you were raising. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, e can... Even though we are um, here talking about CLSA, I think the um, fellow who was just talking, Anyway, there, there is actually an enormous other research enterprise called Age Well, which had many presentations at this meeting. And it is led by uh, people who are engineers who are trying to make devices which you can use and which you know, won't create that divide that we heard about. So other researchers are working on those products. No. Hi, <laughs> no, thank you. you. Uh, a teeny question. Um, the importance of sleep. Um, I am just wondering uh, how much influence in the data that you've collected, how much relevance in your studies has that come up with? Because I, I for one, and I'm sure there are many, that have a form of sleep apnea or, or sleep disorder, which doesn't always get easier as one gets older, and if you don't get a good, a good sleep, sometimes maybe you don't want to socialize, etc., etc. And does it do a number on high blood pressure? Other, you know, it could can contribute, I believe, to other health problems. It's just, a, I'm just it's just a curiosity on my part. We do have a number of questions on sleep in the CLSA, and there are a number of teams who are working on sleep and quality of life and various other aspects related to it. Um, and we do have questions on sleep apnea as well. So um, I don't think any of us are directly working with the sleep questions, but there are teams who are. There is a just project using CLSA data that has been put together and we are just looking at the paper itself, which has looked at the sleep and obesity issues as well. And so in the coming year, a lot more will be coming out. And please go and watch on our website as these papers emerge and you'll see some interesting findings. Oh, okay, one last question. Okay, my question is about the social interaction and the isolation. I am on the ones where you just phone me in, and I think it's important that we, we note exactly what we're doing. So I don't, didn't notice anything about work in that social interaction. We're farmers, so our social interaction is on the farm, and there'll be other self-employed people whose social interaction is their business as well as their social life, like our, our whole life is farming. So just, just to point that out, I just thought that was an interesting part. You're right in probably the measures that we described here, that part was not probably incorporated as much. But CLSA does collect information as to what happens at workplace, and it has some participation questions that also relate to work uh, that could easily be incorporated in, in the future analyses as uh, as the interactions that happen at workplaces as well. In, the, in that little preliminary study we did, you know, you would, the boys downstairs. Uh, just based on the description you gave, you would not have counted as a person who was socially isolated. Um, we had an interesting conversation in the poster session today with someone from Stats Canada and um, CLSA and Stats Canada have worked closely together. And I think we were at the same post of Raina. And the, the, the conclusion of the person from Stats Canada was that social isolation was a bigger problem in Toronto than it was in small rural communities. And we had to scratch our heads over that. But, you know, people are thinking about what you asked in your question. 
We'll take one last question. We have some of our presenters have to go to the airport. So one last question. Not a question, a statement. I came by bus. It cost me a dollar eighteen cents. I got an hour time for transfer. It's on those new little cards you can get. Almost everybody can get to this part of Winnipeg by bus. They have buses that lower down. You get a special place to sit if you have a wheelchair or anything. I'd strongly encourage people to come by bus. <laughs> Good ending. Thank you very much. Um, again, thanks very much for coming. I uh, hope well, we'll stay in touch and we'll see you at your next visit at either uh, the Deer Lodge Center or via phone. And uh, thanks to the presenters. <laughs>